November of 1998, a new game was releasing on PCs around the world, and it was blowing minds. Half-Life had taken the gaming community by storm, with beautiful visuals, a unique story, and creative level design. It ended up winning over 40 Game of the Year awards by June of 1999, when the Game of the Year edition was launched, and would end up with over 50 of the awards in total. The gameplay at first seems like a straightforward first-person shooter, but eventually you realize that boss battles are few and far between, and even characters you might consider boss-like don't require a lot of firepower, but a bit of brain power. You start to notice that you're being tasked with solving a small puzzle in order to progress. You play as the respectable and bespectacled Gordon Freeman, a silent protagonist caught in an unexpected tragedy. Now, to be upfront about it, these aren't genius level puzzles or anything. Half-Life is extremely linear. Look in the opposite of direction of where you just came from, and you'll probably be able to figure out where you need to go. But the impressive part is that most of the time, while you're playing, you don't really feel like the game is necessarily holding your hand. It's obvious that the game is frequently guiding you where you need to go, but in the game you feel like you just tried a door and it happened to be locked or you went down a path that was blocked by some debris, so you had to turn back. Although they're simple tricks of level design, it feels natural given the environment and the situation that's unfolding in front of you. More on that in a bit. The graphics of Half-Life were astonishing in 1998. The game was based on the original Quake engine at first, but under license, the engine had become known as Gold SRC, or Gold Source. It was so heavily modified that even though Half-Life launched around the time Quake 2 launched, I still believe to this day that Half-Life was a far better looking game, and it had many more intricate details that made it stand out over Quake and Quake 2. Still, there's no denying the effect that those games had on Half-Life. In a speech given at the 2005 Austin Games Conference entitled The Hypermodern Muse, the man credited with fleshing out the Half-Life storyline, Mark Laidlaw, said that he wanted to be a level designer because he felt like video games were where modern storytelling was headed. In place of plot or story, these games have architecture, he said. They're telling stories mutely. It obviously struck a chord with him. The sound is excellent. The game included CD-based music that would be triggered by certain events, although most of the game featured no music and was limited to atmosphere and imagination, when the music kicked on, you knew it was getting serious. The music was excellently paired with the on-screen action, and you barely even notice its presence as it helps to escalate or reduce your adrenaline. The sound effects have a great number of samples, and are varied to a degree that they don't get too annoying. Certain sounds, like some of the explosions and Gordon's crowbar and how it crashes against some crates and boards before they break, can get old. But all in all, there's nothing so repetitive that I start to lose my mind. So what is the story to Half-Life? That can be hard to say. It depends on what angle you look at the original game from. The game's instruction manual doesn't do anything to set up the game. Instead, it features a welcome letter, onboarding Gordon Freeman to Black Mesa as a new scientist. It sets the stage for the player to enter the lab with no preconceived notion of terror. The tragic accident then unfolds before your eyes. You start your day as you likely start every day, on the tram on the way to work. toxicity of material routinely handled in the Black Mesa compound. No smoking, eating, or drinking are permitted within the... Down and down you go, deeper underground into your top secret facility. When you arrive, you find out that there are bugs with the computer system and that nobody's having a particularly great day. I had a bunch of messages for you, but we had a system crash about 20 minutes ago and I'm still trying to find my files. Just one of those days, I guess. They were having some problems down in the test chamber, too, but I think that's all straightened out. They told me to make sure you headed down there as soon as you got into your hazard suit. Still, you suit up and proceed to the test chamber, where an anomalous material of unknown origin waits for you. You basically shovel it into a pit and zap it with some sort of MacGuffin plot device, and that's when chaos erupts.
having one of the few HEV, or hazardous environment suits, and also being roundly blamed for causing this catastrophe, Gordon is tasked with getting to the surface and trying to get help. The rest of the game you try to escape, as the military attempts to cover up your experiments, the mysterious G-Man in a suit and tie is seen several times, very calmly proceeding through precarious predicaments, and even some other consequences of your team attempting to rip apart the very fabric of reality start to take hold. This is known as the Black Mesa Incident, and although I don't have a single introductory cutscene or long-winded narrative from the instruction manual, it's still safe to say that when it comes to Half-Life, the story is what set the game apart from everything else at the time, and has remained something that to this day is almost uniquely Half-Life. Unreal had launched just a few months before Half-Life, and Quake 2 was coming. Both games featured revolutionary 3D graphics, powered for the first time by things like OpenGL, Direct3D, and 3DFX's Glide. But not only were the visuals genuinely impressive, each of the games told their stories in different ways. Quake 2 had a dramatic intro cutscene. Unreal had tons of data pads with logs and journal entries to flesh out the world. And Half-Life had... well, Gordon. The entire story of Half-Life, from the moment the game fades in until the second the credits begin to roll, is told through the eyes of Gordon Freeman. I reached out to Mark Laidlaw to find out just how intentional this was. He was kind enough to respond to a few of my questions, including a question about whether or not a recent game theory holds any water with the game's head writer. That's called a teaser, my friends. He's a busy man, and I'm nobody in particular, so you can read the whole brief interview on my website over at newangel.net. There will be a link in the description. But when I asked if Half-Life had ever intended to have cutscenes, he responded, I never wished for cutscenes, but I assumed we would have some. And now, I can't imagine it with cutscenes. The lack of them became our virtue. He's absolutely right. I can't think of another game that actually tells the entire story through the eyes of one character. It never cuts away, it never switches perspective. It's all happening to the player. I went on to ask about the spin-off games, Half-Life Blue Shift and Half-Life Opposing Force. The games tell the story of the Black Mesa incident, but one from the perspective of one of the Black Mesa security officers, and the other from the point of view of one of the Marines tasked with trying to cover up the Black Mesa incident and hunt down Gordon Freeman. I always thought this was a smart method of telling a broader story, and Laidlaw admitted that this had been Valve President Gabe Newell's idea. It's also interesting to note how they outsource this work to companies like Gearbox while allowing their main team to focus on the real sequel, which unfortunately wouldn't come for another six years. I also asked Laidlaw about the old rumor of the Ivan the Space Biker character, the original placeholder model for Gordon Freeman, pictures of which can be seen floating around the internet. I asked if he was ever expected to write a game based on that character, and luckily he didn't have to. He told me that he was actually more partial to the idea of never seeing Gordon, allowing the player to completely immerse themselves in the experience. Here's what he had to say. I never heard about Ivan until pretty late. The others joked about him. I never saw that character in the game at all. The experiment gone wrong was already part of the story, but when I first started working on the game, it was something that had already happened when the game began. I eventually saw a way to have it happen as part of the game, and that worked out better. There was no attachment to a visual bespectacled Gordon, though. That happened mostly in the marketing. There was a player model for multiplayer, and we had to put something on the box, but I thought we might ship without ever establishing a visual identity for the character. I favored not making him look any particular way. Although our silent protagonist has become iconic, the original Half-Life is now nearly 20 years old, and the last installment of the game officially came over 10 years ago last month in the form of Half-Life 2 Episode 2. And while some people consider the story of the games rather shallow, having a gaming experience where the principle of show, don't tell is strictly adhered to makes for an engaging campaign. Living through so many years where multiplayer games where you just try to rack up a kill count is supposed to be fun, to experience a narrative that doesn't feel the need to cut away or rely on a flashback to tell you what's going on is refreshing. I openly encourage everyone to experience the events of Half-Life firsthand, as it is one of the most immersive gaming experiences a player could have up until that point in time. And its fun factor still holds up today. Even though I was maybe 15 the first time I played the game, it has stuck with me for more than half of my life making it one of the most influential games in our story 
so far. Hey everybody, thanks for watching episode 56 of Our Story So Far TV. I am Garrett, aka New Angel, and by the way, I asked Mark Laidlaw several more questions, and definitely some of the most interesting ones weren't really related to this particular video. So I encourage everyone to head over to newangel.net to read the latest interview with a legend in the games industry. I appreciate it if you like, comment, and subscribe, and if you want to talk to me on Twitter, I'm at New Angel, that's N-U-A-N-G-E-L. These videos are part of my other website, which you can find over at ourstorysofar.tv, where you can find every single one of these episodes in 1080p quality. I am a busy man, and this one's going to be cutting it close, but I like to have a new episode ready for you guys every two weeks, so please come on back soon. Until next time, take care of yourself.